Hello, I'm David R. Jones of the Community Service Society. During the next year, New York State and New York City must close an estimated $12 billion budget gap for the state and nearly $3 billion for the city. Budget cuts and increased taxes, next on the Urban Agenda. Joining me now is New York State Assemblyman Scott Stringer, whose district includes Manhattan's West Side and Clinton communities. He is the newly appointed chair of the Assembly's Cities Committee, and Ronnie Lowenstein, director of the Independent Budget Office, a publicly funded city agency providing greater understanding of the city budget. Welcome to the Urban Agenda. Thank you. Twelve billion at the state level, three billion at the city level. Uh, this is, sounds more like the perfect storm than it sounds like uh, talking about budget numbers. How did we get into this? Uh, Ronnie, I'll let you say, how did the city get a $3 billion deficit? Uh, it's actually down from where it started. Um, the city's been in fiscal difficulty for several years now, a combination of, of course, 9-11, real economic problems in terms of the U.S. economy and Wall Street in particular, um, and some fairly um, short-sighted budgeting over the years that allowed us to build up gaps uh, that weren't going to close unless the economy stayed very, very strong. This is what some of us talk about. The prior administration had a structural budget deficit that they didn't do anything about? Um, that they allowed to keep growing uh, as though the good times would simply never end. And Scott, at the state, $12 billion, I mean, $3 billion is a problem, but $12 billion, how do you miss, miss that target? Well, for many years, uh, this, actually, this budget is man-made. I mean, we've had a governor who for the last eight, nine years has been fiscally irresponsible. Uh, the Assembly Democrats bought into that. Uh, huge tax cuts that um, went on for years and years, Democrats trying to act like Republicans, nobody budgeting into the future. The end result with 9-11 is we have an astronomical budget deficit, and the irresponsible budgeting continues this week, and it's got to stop, and the crisis is very real. And yet I don't get the sense that anyone really wants to take the weight here in terms of, I, I, the governor himself has said over, you know, no new tax cuts, though he's cutting taxes. Well, uh, the governor is uh, amazing because he can get up with a straight face and say, no new taxes, no job-killing taxes. And yet, for New York City residents in particular, we've already seen the $1.4 billion transit tax. That's the transit fare. Right. We see the uh, tax on CUNY and SUNY students. Uh, we see the tax on uh, a whole host of hidden fees and services that when you add it all up, this is the biggest tax increase governor we've seen. And he seems to be trying to balance the budget on the most vulnerable among us, people in New York City, people who are barely making it, the people who are being or avoiding this crisis are the top 1% in this state and in this city. Ronnie, in the city, I mean, what is this going to mean? How do you balance a whole of $3 billion? And what, what seems to be the way this thing is going? I mean, where do you find, on the revenue side, where are they going to find money? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, this year's budget gap, which was significantly large, was mainly balanced by long-term borrowing in the wake of 9-11, right. which, of course, causes huge long-term problems for the city in terms of debt service and And, and what does that mean to the, the right people? You know, so you borrow. That's fine. What, what could that do to us later on? We're still paying $500 million a year for MAC borrowings, Municipal Assistance Corporation borrowings, that were done in the 70s when the city needed to be bailed out. When many of our viewers weren't born yet. Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was, but... <laughs> no, we're the old... Uh, I, a little bit. Scott, Elizabeth, okay. <laughs> I'm not admitting So, it. essentially, so, we're mortgaging the future of, of but, a lot of New Yorkers. But I think the city's past that point, and now they're saying, okay, you know, we've done that. We're not going to be doing that next year. The, both the mayor and the council are saying, no, we're not going to be doing that next year. They've already done a significant property tax increase for this year and next. They've done spending cuts, although some of the worst of the impacts don't really hit until next year. Um, what the mayor has proposed for next year, um, unfortunately, relies a lot on other layers of government, the state of New York, the federal government, to help the city well, close its remaining Well, let's problems. talk about some of the suggestions the mayor has made in terms of what he expects out of the state. Um, uh, why don't you take the highlights of it? Okay. Uh, by far the very biggest of them is extending the city's personal income tax to commuters. Um, that has a lot of economic logic behind it. Um, 
the city does have an income tax, states have income taxes, they do extend them to commuters, um, but it's literally six times the size of the commuter tax that was already abolished, and it's hard to see that there's going to be a lot of political muscle well, behind this, it. Well, Scott, is this dead on arrival? It shouldn't be done on arrival. Actually, after we got rid of the commuter tax, which was one of the most bizarre things Albany ever did, um, I introduced a bill to reinstate it at the 0.45 percent rate. And this was a bipartisan decision. The, this this, was, this was Democrats and Republicans yes. engaging in the highest form of testosterone politics over a state senate seat in Westchester that has cost the city, Ronnie, I think $2 billion since we so lost far? it, since we lost it, which is almost yeah. the size of this deficit. But what's interesting about it is that I cannot imagine that Long Island legislators and people who are now sitting there recognizing what the contribution was of our police and fire and EMS workers on September 11th. You know, those our folks were up those stairs protecting people who lived in Long Island, New Jersey, and Connecticut. What they would not have given families and friends and all of us to pay a little bit to keep that service going is amazing. That that's not the, on the, the table. The other now. thing I didn't realize until I was talking to people is how common commuter taxes are across the country. Oh, Virtually every yeah. major city, I mean, we, uh, you know, the sort of reaction is, how could they even think of such a thing? I, as far as I can determine, literally every other major city in America has. Nobody in Long Island, right. nobody in the tri-state area has ever called the legislator, to my knowledge, and said, can we abolish the commuter tax? Mm -hmm. it, was, it was a non-starter. Nobody went to work in the morning thinking about paying that commuter tax. They're more mad about the taxes on their phone bill than worried about a commuter tax. But the implication for the city is tremendous. Right? But meanwhile, though, the, what the administration, the Bloomberg administration has proposed is, is not only something that's very much larger, but actually placing this tax on commuters while at the same time cutting taxes for New York City residents. So you would get a, if you were a resident, you'd get a personal get income tax cut. In sum, what would happen is you would be picking up about $2 billion from the commuters and cutting about a billion dollars from New York City residents for a net gain of about a billion for the city. Um, what that works out to, particularly since he coupled it with, uh, by, by saying, well, we need something to, to offset some of the pain of the property tax increases, um, is that for wealthy New Yorkers, for people with incomes of about 200000 a year and up, there would actually be a net tax decrease for city residents. Hmm. And that's going to be a very, very tough hard. political I, I, I sell. Don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that proposal is, is going to be in the form that he thinks. I will I tell you what, what the mayor has to do, though. Yeah. He made a tactical political error. And one o, Politics 101 says that when you're about to endorse a governor, uh, as Bloomberg endorsed Pataki, <laughs> you get sit down and writing. get something for it and get it in writing. <laughs> and it was amazing that the governor could go through the whole gubernatorial election, never mention the word budget, never mention the word tax increase. Bloomberg, yeah. Mayor Bloomberg let him do that. I always thought that they had sat in a room and Bloomberg and Pataki winked and said, I'm going to take care of your town. And that was a blunder that, that was playing out right now. We need the mayor to step up and demand these Republicans to, to protect the Republican mayor. I mean, now, there's another suggestion out there for us Brooklyn, Brooklynites is obviously like waving a red flag, which is tolling the East River bridges. Yeah. And what is, what, first of all, what would that look like? Ronnie, have you, uh, from the IBO's point of view? Uh, well, we've been working on it, and uh, our numbers aren't final yet, but certainly it'd be a source of major revenues, um, mm -hmm. and a lot of the congestion problems that people used to worry about in terms of bridge tolls, long lines at toll booths, is, is now a thing of the past, given the technology changes right. that have come about. Obviously, if you live in Brooklyn, it's problematic, um, mm -hmm. and it's also problematic for small businesses. And, you know, if, there, if the city does go down this road, um, you would hope that they would find some way to minimize the impact uh, on those who are really lowest income people who need their well, cars. Well, what about having businesses. Brooklynites and all the people in the boroughs not be having to pay the East River tolls, but only people from Long Island? And the technology exists <laughs> to do that. Uh, whether that you I'm can sorry, get that for to all fly. our listeners, uh, our viewers out in Long Island, <laughs> it's a that's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> the joke but it's, actually, <laughs> it's actually being discussed. We've heard it discussed. It was less no tolls for people in Brooklyn and more like reduced tolls, in much the same way they do over the Verrazano Bridge in Staten Island right, now. Of course. Now, Scott, this one isn't necessarily in such trouble. I heard that Joe Bruno, the head of the, uh, the state senate, uh, the Republican head of the state senate, says he might consider this. Is that is that your understanding or? He's got to consider a lot of things. Right. Um, he's got to continue to oppose uh, tobacco securitization. He's right. got to continue to try to 
at least show some independence of the governor so we can get to a budget that is fair. Right. So, uh, yeah, I think, but I think a lot is on the table. I think he could consider a lot of things, but it takes a three-way to do it, you know, right. three-way agreement. Well, let's talk about the service cuts, where clearly the governor has made a determination that we're going to cut this to pieces. And there are two places that we hear about, and I'll start with the city and you, Ronnie, in terms of education uh, and health care. Uh, how is it going to roll out for the city of New York from your perspective? On the independent budget office. The city's already done significant cuts in education over the last year and a half that largely have avoided hitting the classrooms. What the governor's proposing here is eliminating pre-K, which serves at this point uh, something like 45,000 four-year-olds in New York City every right. year, um, and also cutting back about a hundred million dollars for class size reduction K through three which has been a large part of the city's efforts to, to reduce class sizes in recent years. Just talking about the preschool, I used to be a youth service commissioner under the Koch administration, and we found that really what pre-K and uh, extended day for kindergarten provide uh, is working parents the ability to keep at work, and particularly people who don't have jobs that allow for flexibility. So we're essentially going to make it that much more difficult for the working poor, or people who want to force off welfare, to make it if you cut this back. This is really, you know, you take it out of this way as a cut, you're also going to cost you in terms of additional welfare and support. You, you, you make a good point. As the new chair of the city's committee at these sure. difficult times, we did a analysis, a quick analysis of the state, with the budget, the state budget, how it would impact on New York City. And what we broke down the billions and found out that the average families, people with kids in public school, people who, CUNY students who need to work, the budget numbers on individual families it's thousands of dollars in direct money that they're going to have to pay poor people, middle income people, to balance this budget. And it's amazing when you see what the direct hit is to an average family. So, what are the elected officials thinking here, Scott? I, I won't ask my nonpartisan side here. Uh -huh. What in the world is going on here? I mean, these are, these are voters. These are not just ordinary people. I mean, you're really. Uh, taking a lot out of the hides of voting people, and yet... Well, we're, the fight is now. I mean, part of what the agenda has to be is we're trying to mobilize students and tenants, uh, people who are advocates, people who work in the healthcare field, the unions, and try to create a movement that will show Albany that to mess with students and, and middle-income people is bad politics. It's, it's irresponsible, but it's also bad politics. And part of what we have to do in the next few weeks with Community Service Society and others is people learn what the, what's at stake here, that they have to call their lawmakers and say, don't cave in to Pataki's budget. Do not cave in. Stay the course and make sure that we re restore some of these essential cuts. And then look for new revenue. That, and that's what we have to look at, new revenue. We'll be right back to continue the urban agenda. No, I understand we're late. But things have been a little hard, and we're really trying. Well, my husband has a second job. Well, no, I know, I know that, but we're trying really hard, and it's just that, mm, yes, I, we, no, I know, well. Hey, you want to make I understand it's a final notice. discussing the New York State and City budget crisis with Assemblyman Scott Stringer and Ronnie Lowenstein, who heads the Independent Budget Office. Before we start, Ronnie, tell us what is the Independent Budget Office? It's Very shortly. a city-funded uh, fiscal think tank uh, that does nonpartisan work answering people's questions about budget for the media, for elected officials, um, for advocacy groups, everyone. This is like the GAO for, for the city of New York, or is that it's more like general the accounting C office? It's more like the Congressional Budget Office, okay. although we, unlike the Congressional Budget Office, which reports to Congress, we're purely independent. Right. Let's talk, uh, Scott, about what does this mean? I'm, I'm sitting out here. I, I got a job. Maybe I have a job, or I'm trying to get a job. What does all this stuff mean to me? What does it mean to my grandmother? What does it mean to my kids? What is all this budget stuff? It's not going to impact us, right? I well, mean, how is it, it going to actually it's come a, it's, a very, it's a very good point. When you read the editorials or the headlines, a uh, $1.4 billion transit tax and a $1.2 billion cut in education, you kind of go through life and say, these are big numbers. It is for me as well. Right. But when you break down this budget and you look, if you're a family of four and you're living in Queens and you're a teacher or a doorman and you have a kid at CUNY and you want another kid in public schools, and when you add it all up, suddenly you realize that I'm making $42,000 a year, 
this Pataki budget, this New York City fiscal crisis, if enacted, Pataki budget will just the state part. Our study that we released a few weeks ago shows that that family will pay two thousand dollars more. Two thousand dollars more. You can't afford that on forty-two thousand dollars with children. And it's, it's interesting. We did a survey uh, in August. It's already a little dated. Uh, that was looking at what people were experienced who were very, who were poor or near poor. And we did, I guess, the largest of its type. We did 600 telephone interviews. And I was stunned about, about the amount of problems. This was before these cuts hit. Uh, you were getting in, in numbers as high as 50% of the respondents saying they were having critical housing problems. Either they had gotten an eviction notice, mm -hmm. or they had been unable to pay uh, a rent for at least a month, or they couldn't pay a utility bill. And this was all pre this next hit. And I never realized just how extreme things have gotten. And that was just one of the indicators of need that was starting to emerge. People here. in the city, a lot of people, the majority of the people live paycheck to paycheck yeah. and hope that there's a continuing paycheck. You know, I think that part of the, the horrific part of this budget process, when you look in the eyes of the students who go to CUNY, who we Great. made a covenant with, we said, if you go to school, go to high school, stay away from drugs, stay away from all the bad elements in your community, but get that high school diploma. We're going to give you safe passage to a college education. And when they, and now to look in their eyes and say, if we pass Pataki's budget, this 40% tuition increase, take away, tap, tap, we've broken that bond and that covenant with these kids. And I can't imagine what would happen if we lost thousands and thousands of students who well, are not going to go back to school, Dave, and they're going to be out in the streets. With well, you know, and, and we're seeing, we actually, we're seeing two signs of that. I mean, all these sort of welfare rights organizers, and even on, on all sides of the, the political spectrum, recognize there's a clear correlation between people who can either keep off welfare or, or stay off welfare after being on it if they have education. And so you're, you're, you're putting a knife right in the, the very problem that really everyone wanted to deal with, which was cutting the number of people who were dependent upon government support. And we're ensuring that we'll save a short term and ensure long-term problems. But the other thing more worrisome, we have an office out in Bedford-Stuyvesant. For the first time in years, after all this talk about lowering crime, the numbers of drive-by shootings and outrageous actions of people who are mainly, mainly young, who are clearly not connected to the world of work or education, is beginning to increase. That's, it's the first warning sign. Everyone has tried to, oh, we've got crime under control, and it has nothing to do with the economy, just tough policing. You know, Charles Dickens understood the causal <laughs> connection. Too many people poor, too many young people poor, and you're like lighting a match, you know, on a, on a, on a major problem of social dislocation. And the difficulty is it's very hard to organize in poor communities if we're going to go back to the, the gang wars we had uh, you know, two decades ago that were fueled by e economic instability. Well, part, no of, part of what's happening in the budget cuts, the summer job programs are on the table, uh, prevention programs are on the table. I mean, this is, pound, this is maybe penny wise, but it's certainly pound foolish because, you know, a lot of people believe that it's more expensive to keep people in prison. It's a lot cheaper to do prevention programs economically summer jobs make sense and we've got to get that message out there and we cannot give up on our kids. I mean, that's what it's about. Ronnie, just to depress our, our viewers <laughs> totally, <laughs> let's talk about health care. <laughs> the other area where the governor and, and to a lesser extent the mayor is talking about is obviously health care issues. And sure. what is being laid out, at least from the IBO's point of view, in terms of the health care equation? Well, uh, certainly nothing good. Mm -hmm. um, the city was actually looking to Albany just from its own budget perspective to seek some budget relief on Medicaid, whether you know, Albany takes over more of it or Albany finds ways to cut back on Medicaid payments, um, which is a different story and, right. and I think in many ways more fundamental, while at the same time helping the city's fiscal situation because the city and the state, of course, split the costs. Right. Um, in fact, what the governor proposed um, took a great deal of creativity to actually come up with Medicaid cuts that actually left the city worse, the city fiscally worse off than before. And that, of course, translates not only into budget, more budget problems for the city, but decreasing eligibility for, for folks who depend upon these systems, um, less generous programs, um, lower payments to hospitals and providers, which, of course, then circles back to the city fiscal situation again. Uh, to the extent that the city has HHC, then you know, Health and Hospitals Corporation is in trouble, and the city has to fill that as well. 
So uh, from every perspective, you know, they've, they've pr made a number of proposals that both fiscally and in terms of real people are problematic. It's interesting. I, I served on the Health and Hospitals Corporation board until the mayor decided not to be, the Giuliani mayor decided not to reappoint me. But um, one of the things I used to always tell in speeches to people, in the midst of the Great Depression, Mayor LaGuardia faced with the same kind of things. He was cutting back services. There was no money. The only thing he put money in, only increases, were in public hospitals because he felt it was inappropriate to let people to die, on, die on the streets. I wish we had that kind of vision. Mm -hmm. We haven't talked about the federal government. Of course, you know, they're, they're winning the war wherever they're fighting it uh, <laughs> against America. Or, I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, where, uh, the, Don't talk that way about yes, General Bush. You know, that's he right. is, he, he's in his tank. What, and there, there have been requests, I assume, and I, we've been somewhat concerned that we haven't heard much pressure being brought either by the mayor or the governor on our president, who's also a Republican and, and obviously uh, is concerned about New Yorkers. After, you know, September 11th, he came and said we were the w most wonderful city in the world and he was going to do everything necessary. What gives here? I'll start with you, Scott. You know, Alan Hevesy uh, said it best, I think, uh, that, you know, 911, New York City took the hit for the rest of the nation and maybe the world. And we have a president who hasn't been acting as if we should remember that. I think the memory fades as he goes on to other things. And that's really unfortunate. This, you know, part of what we need from the federal government is we need an urban agenda. We need, peop we need a government that's going to build up our cities. And the way you do that, especially in New York, is to provide us with the funds that can allow us to get out of this economic crisis. He has been... And Ronnie, how, how would it be done? Well, uh, I think it's also just good economics. Um, right now, there are 46 states across the country, that, and so there are a lot of Republicans and Democrats out right. there uh, that are facing huge budget shortfalls for next year. They're talking about over $80 billion so dollars collectively. Right, 100 billion around the country. Right. right. Um, that's a lot of constituency that you would think could go to Washington and say, look, if you're talking about a stimulus package, you know, here's, we, we guarantee you if you give us these funds, we will be spending them instantly or a little bit before that. Um, so it's, it's a very direct stimulus, and there's a huge constituency for it, and it's hard to see why that hasn't moved the administration. I sort of feel like I'm part of a foreign nation sometimes in New York State <laughs> and City. I mean, uh, you, you get the feeling that, you know, we're sort of an enemy power here. But, but, can I, can I, but it's I, everywhere across the country. I know, but I, they, they're treating us. states in a very odd way. I thought that was the whole deal. He was a but, governor. I don't care. But <laughs> countercyclical aid, I even hear, heard the head of publisher of Cranes, not a, you know, necessarily off the chart and progressive, saying they couldn't understand while the notion of this kind of revenue sharing when to, to stimulate the economy, you always want it at a state and local level, just what the Republicans keep talking well, about. Well, you know, yeah. re re relating it just back to New York City for a minute, I think we've got to remind some of these folks that New York City it basically, and tell me if I'm wrong about this, we we push this economy. I mean, the reason that New York State is even around is because of what we do economically in New York City and in Manhattan, and they forget this. I mean, if it wasn't for the New York City economy, I mean, upstate New York would be a wasteland, and we've got to remind legislators. Well, it's, it's interesting why the case hasn't been made, and, and this is a, a political issue, which I, I talked, Ronnie and I can't talk about this, but <laughs> why, Bring it has, on. <laughs> why hasn't the case been made more effectively and the outrage, you know, well, cause rate I'll tell, cause I'll tell you what, um, Republican mayor didn't want to um, attack a Republican governor. This is the price we pay. Um, you have Democrats who act like Republicans um, because we're afraid to use words like, you know, we're not allowed to say tax increases. It's forbidden. Democrats and Republicans, we don't like to say increased taxes. We like to talk now about revenue enhancers. That's the word du jour now. We're going to hear a lot of revenue enhancers. So it's a game that we're playing among ourselves, and it's a game that's spilling out into the public. Why can't we have a commuter tax? Well, if we have a commuter tax, we're going to call it something different. Now, this is an $11 billion, $12 billion budget crisis. The games are over. Family of four can't make it with this budget. You know, this New York City could implode over this fiscal crisis. Ronnie, and just in a closing, what do, you, what do you think the city should do in less than 30 seconds? How would you, what would you suggest from what you know in terms of a, a reasonable revenue support? that would be equitable and, and not, not regressive, as they say. Okay. Uh, well, if you're looking for other tax sources, there are lots of them. I mean, the city could go to the top end of its income distribution and rely more heavily on its progressive income tax. 
mm -hmm. um, that could raise significant funds. Long term, it's, it's problematic. I mean, right. it does have an impact. But as a surcharge, it could be done. Uh, yeah. The trick here is going to be to find some way to convince people that it's temporary. Right. Um, and if we can do that, then I think it's going to be way more palatable. Scott, in closing? Let's do the commuter tax. Let's do progressive taxation. Let's have an honest discussion. Raise revenue to close the budget deficit. We can't close the budget deficit just um, cutting services and ruining people's lives. My thanks to Assemblyman Scott Stringer and Ronnie Lowenstein, Director of the Independent Budget Office. When times are tough, it always gets tougher for those with the least. Balancing budgets is about making choices, deciding who will feel the pain the sharpest. CSS urges the governor and the mayor to think again about the poor and working poor throughout New York State, the elderly, and our children. I'm David R. Jones of the Community Service Society. Thank you for watching The Urban Agenda. To comment on the Urban Agenda or for more information on CSS, contact Community Service Society of New York, 105 East 22nd Street, New York, New York, 10010, area code 212-254-8900.